Good morning. Still good morning, I think, yes. And uh, welcome, everybody, to our workshop on a new trends in uh, evaluation and assessment in scholarly communication, uh, more specifically on peer review and assessment. And um, my name is Edith, and my colleague is Judith here. We are from the University of Debrecen in Hungary. And the reason we are here, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting us uh, for the second time around <laughs> to Maribor. Um, the reason we are here is that um, our institution, and we personally have been uh, involved in a lot of EU-funded projects on um, open science and, uh, and uh, transforming uh, uh, nature of um, peer review and uh, assessment. So. That's why we would like to share our experiences or our, our knowledge with you here today. This will be a workshop, which means you will have to do some work as well. It will be an interactive event, and the structure will follow. Uh, uh, what will be organized here for you today is, um, is a 90-minute event, which will start with some uh, background information on open peer review and, uh, and assessment as well. Uh, that will um, and give you the background and the context of our uh, group discussion, which will be followed by these um, uh, short uh, summaries. And uh, then we will have 45 minutes of uh, group group work, and we will conclude. Our your discussions, your results will be shared with the whole group at the end, and that will be basically the. Uh, we will try to find some common grounds. Uh, here. Uh, so, um, Judith will start with uh, some background on open science. I will then uh, follow with open peer review and then uh, probably I will ask you, since we have uh, only a short limited time here together, um, this, um, our presentations will be followed a word coffee style group uh, discussion and I will like to ask you to cooperate with a really uh, swift um, uh, organization of the, uh, the room for the group work, okay? So, but we will give you step-by-step -step instructions anyway, so I will give the floor to Judith. So thank you for introducing me, Edith. Uh, first of all, I would like to highlight uh, uh, the different aspects of open science and how it, uh, uh, gain, uh, how it uh, c comes uh, uh, with the, the research process itself. Um, I would really uh, like to start with, uh, uh, there is a French physiologist, uh, uh, his name is uh, Claude Bernard, and he once said, uh, art is I, science is we. And on this research life cycle uh, structure, you can see how complex the research life cycle itself, and uh, this this is a uh, this has been uh, created uh, by the University Library of Central Florida. They uh, created this uh, research life cycle uh, uh, illustration to like find out which are the places where a library comes into place uh, in the field of. Uh, research support, I would say. And in that sense, uh, you can, uh, the library is this uh, blue sign. It has been signed with this blue icon. And you can see there are so many, uh, uh, on this uh, different uh, cycle basis, we, uh, they define four different cycle parts. Uh, the planning cycle, the project cycle, the publication cycle, and the 21st uh, century digital scholarship cycle or maybe we can even call it uh, the sustainability cycle. I would rather call it this way because this is where we preserve and disseminate our research output. And as you can see, there are so many items where a library comes uh, into force. And in all of these uh, little aspects of these cycles, we can use open science uh, uh, <clears throat> workflows. So what is open science? 
uh, open science is uh, such a scientific practice. There are like so many different uh, definitions for open science. I like to go to this part because it's such, an, uh, it's such a scientific practice where the generated information within uh, the research process is openly available. Uh, the research is collaborative, uh, transparent and accessible. Uh, its main purpose is to support the continuous development of research, science and innovation and uh, to share knowledge. It uses digital technologies, which is really important in open science. We're using the digital advancements. Why is it important? Why is it uh, important to have open science practices included in our research workflows? Uh, it is uh, because of the visibility of our results, uh, sustainability issues, and uh, it uh, gains us more innovation opportunities. Uh, and scientific research became uh, highly data-driven, uh, and uh, th that's why we moved to a different path when we are conducting our research. Uh, that's why we are talking, I would say that's why we are talking about open science, because we see we cannot uh, have uh, the old system uh, preserved. We need to like move forward with this digital investment uh, in, um, and uh, we need to like, we depend on, oops, sorry, we depend on computing, we depend on shared data, softwares, and uh, the growing uh, need of infrastructures, uh, and we don't want to have like uh, duplicate, uh, duplicated uh, research, uh, and actually it helps to improve economy. Open science is uh, mostly um, defined with an umbrella. I don't really like the umbrella term because the mushroom shows its complexity, the complexity of open science. Uh, open science, uh, this, uh, this mushroom was drawn by Eva Mendes. Uh, she is uh, the director of uh, open, research, open science uh, platform, uh, European open science platform, sorry. Uh, and, uh, she drew uh, this uh, mushroom uh, because she wanted to show that without proper gov governance and standards, without the roots of a mushroom, mushroom doesn't really have a root, but it doesn't matter at uh, this uh, point, uh, without the roots, we won't be able to achieve uh, open science practices. So we need governance and we need infrastructures, research integrity, uh, rewarding systems, and so on. Uh, here on my slide, you can see the open science taxonomy. It shows the complexity and how mm, different uh, aspects of uh, open science uh, we are talking about. So mainly it is uh, included in all uh, segments of the research process. Uh, what is open science about and why we are referring to it and trying to uh, have uh, this as a default? Uh, because uh, we have a continuous change in technology, uh, continuous change in evaluation of the results, reproducibility, transparency and sustainability. And how we can achieve a continuous change if all the elements of uh, the complex change uh, is uh, proper, then we will achieve a change. If, they, if any of them is missing, then we uh, won't succeed. So vision, skills, incentives, resources, and action plan needed. Okay, I will give the floor back to Edith. And she will uh, get into open peer review. So peer review uh, and open peer review more specifically. Why is it really important to to keep talking about it, and it has been uh, an issue for like the past decade already, um, uh, and um, why it is really important to, to keep this uh, discussion alive um, is because um, our publishing system has extended or has been, uh, um, become more complex in the, in the past uh, decades, and there are so many new options emerging um, which actually supplements this, the, the traditional way of thinking about publishing. 
um, that there's so many different options now, which comes with new tools and methods about, uh, for evaluation and assessment as well. Another reason why you really we need to talk about this new evaluation form is because there is a huge dissatisfaction among the authors and uh, peer reviewers as well about the traditional blind, double-blind um, uh, peer review system. The, late, the last comprehensive survey on peer review uh, practices was in 1918, I'm sorry, 2018, I apologize. Um, by ASAP Bio, and um, uh, you can see that there are, there are the, the main reasons that, that there is a problem with this uh, system is that um, it's really time consuming. You could see the, the, those which has the, the longest uh, red um, uh, lines. Um, there's a problem with the construct uh, constructive reviews, that they are not getting enough uh, um, uh, feedback. Uh, there's the peer reviews are uh, low quality, or there's, it's time consuming. It's, um, reviewers are not giving uh, the credit for their work. So there are several different aspects of this uh, uh, system which uh, actually needs to be amended or, or transformed to, um, uh, to have the researchers and, and uh, reviewers uh, uh, to get their credit for their work. So that's why open peer review came into the uh, picture. But what is open peer review? There is not one specific um, um, definition for this term. Um, Tony uh, Rosellauer uh, made a huge um, overview or review of the literature out there. And he found 122 different competing uh, definitions in the literature. So how they he, he grouped all these definitions and found that there are some, some aspects of open peer review, what they talked about open peer review, which actually um, uh, define altogether uh, this new trend in evaluation. And open, what mostly talked about is the open identities and open reports, probably uh, from the previous um, presentations you heard that these are the two main aspects of open peer review which come uh, into function, but uh, we cannot forget about the open participation, interaction, and the other aspects of uh, uh, this new trend, basically, which altogether uh, defines uh, uh, this new concept. Um, just really quickly, the review of these definitions, the open identities when the authors and reviewers are aware of each other, open reports when the review uh, texts are uh, published alongside um, uh, the, um, the results, the research, uh, open participation when there are communities involved or interaction between the different um, uh, um, players in, in the whole process. and. Um, and there's an open platform which is really interesting, and I will give you some uh, examples for all these aspects. There are, there's, the discussion is about basically that a lot of people approve and a lot of people or researchers uh, disapprove of this new uh, method. There are pros and cons, obviously, uh, for each aspect of the open peer review. Uh, definitely open identities will give you um, more transparency a more civil language that you pay attention how you talk uh, in, uh, through your reviews, uh, but it uh, takes more uh, work to uh, give a really good quality uh, report, so it's more time consuming. Uh, the, basically the same aspects of open reports, and, but uh, the pros is that if it's published, you can get a credit for your work, um, and, but it's really a time consuming aspect and obviously a lot of young researchers, PhDs, are kind of afraid that if they give an honest, uh, really good uh, review, there might be a problem with their career path because older uh, professors might uh, disapprove of their uh, critics. So open participation is a really important aspect of this process that the whole community or other researchers can give their feedback on uh, specific uh, publications or results. But on the other side, uh, obviously, there are some, uh, some researchers who take uh, this platform and give their, um, um, or 
make themselves an expert and give um, uh, um, critique um, or opinion uh, constantly. So we have to balance these publishing platforms or publishers have to balance these two aspects of uh, uh, inviting uh, a, a bigger community to this evaluation process. But um, if we look at uh, the trends, there, are, there is already a changing um, uh, pr um, nature of the, this uh, process is evolving. The role of peer review is a little bit changing, um, and uh, the role uh, of the specific players are, um, are um, going under a change. For example, editors become more of a mediators uh, between the authors and reviewers, and not really the one who give the final um, say in everything. Uh, the authors are becoming more responsible for their, um, their publishing because if they give, get feedback from more uh, sources, obviously there is a pressure to rewrite uh, the, those articles and definitely there is a responsibility of the community and the peers to get involved in this process. Let me give you some practical or the, how it actually plays out in practice. Um, PRJ publishing, um, actually, yeah, and it is not the first, uh, I mean, it's not the only uh, publishing uh, platform or publishing uh, service which um, already giving uh, rewards for peer reviewing. Uh, in their cases, that they give um, tokens for the reviewers, and you can uh, exchange those tokens for, for example, uh, discount on article processing charges. And um, they uh, have a really uh, high percentage of uh, uh, reviewers who sign their names already and uh, authors who would like to get the reports published alongside their results. Another is the post-publication peer review, which in the last uh, presentations you actually uh, saw it in play, I mean in uh, detail, that um, F1000 Research and Science Open Platform is uh, actually uh, practicing this already for years now, um, uh, and they all also get credit, uh, credit the reviewers and the authors through their ORCID uh, system. Um, another one is called the Collaborative Peer Review, um, which is um, practiced by Frontiers Publishers. Do you know Frontiers? Have you heard? Uh, they, they are the one who introduced uh, years ago this concept that, uh, that they um, connect the authors with the reviewers and they um, uh, help or enhance the, the dialogue between the two. So actually the uh, revisions of these articles have a much better, um, um, they are more productive uh, in this way. So the editor basically is uh, a mediator between um, uh, the two ends of the process. Um, another uh, practical is the interactive peer review by Copernicus Publishing. They actually have, um, they introduced this a long, long time ago and one of the first uh, open peer review-ish uh, method um, uh, for uh, evaluating um, articles. They have two different lines uh, of or two different processes uh, which, uh, which runs parallel. One is doing a blind peer review by experts and the other uh, is uh, by community. They are asking for the community to give uh, feedback on uh, a specific uh, preprint. And at the end, they connect these two different lines of uh, peer reviewing and both the inputs for both lines will give the, the uh, input for the authors to rewrite their uh, um, articles. And, not, uh, and which is uh, a really interesting one is the decoupled peer review, which there are uh, platforms or services like Peerage of Science or Publons, which actually separated uh, themselves from the publishing uh, aspect and they only service peer review uh, for uh, specific journals. They, uh, there is a contract between uh, publishers and these um, uh, services and they provide um, independent peer reviews for these publishers. And obviously you can uh, collect your review um, uh, experience or practice and, um, um, and that's how you actually um, document your uh, review history 
and if some universities are already asking for not just the publishing um, uh, history or experience, but they also ask for peer review history, then that's where you, you can actually share your links through these um, uh, platforms. Okay, so again, uh, referring back to this survey from uh, 2018, um, the, um, the one who, uh, those who answered uh, um, the questions here, uh, s you can see that um, which aspects of uh, uh, open peer review is really important for them. Um, open reports, definitely, at the end, at the back of the line, is uh, uh, one which is really... Um, um, a uh, really important aspect of uh, researchers to consider. Also, um, the journals, peer review practices need to be somehow changed. Um, then on what, an open pre-review manuscript, which is uh, that the preprints uh, are going under these evaluations. Another aspect that researchers would like to see more. And open interaction is up there as well, which they would like to get um, uh, more involved in the process with other actors. So you could see that it's actually a demand or a request uh, from the research community that there would be uh, specific changes uh, installed. And what's really um, important, obviously, is that they get credit for uh, their work um, in, in the peer reviewing. So, just um, uh, strengthening or, or repeating what we have already talked about, why is it important to, to still, uh, still talk about or, or um, uh, continue this discussion because it gives transparency, it uh, gets that credit system for this, uh, this work and um, definitely as educational aspect uh, because the, if the reviewers are getting more credit for it, they need to be a little bit more educated how actually they get involved and how they can give quality reviews. So there should be an educational aspect uh, uh, also included. Uh, accountability, if you, it's not a blind uh, uh, review, and obviously the quality of the feedback will improve as well. Uh, two different ways that actually it's, the discussion is going uh, for open peer review. The one is that um, uh, we are working with the current peer review system, but uh, gradually opening it up through the reports and the identities. And the other is um, just throw everything away and start fresh with a new system, which probably is the more, more difficult to, <laughs> uh, um, to accomplish. But that's another option which uh, will result in a, in a better and more transparent uh, way to look at peer review. Um, so what's needed for this? Uh, in order to be accepted more uh, by uh, research funders and uh, the community, research community as well, definitely there is a coherent framework is missing. There's a lot of talk about how it should be. Well, there are already practices uh, in, uh, um, in action, but definitely there's a coherent framework for a new uh, way of evaluation is uh, uh, needed. And, um, and obviously from the funders and the institutional assessment uh, um, um, structures, there should be a request for a more uh, transparent evaluation as well. Um, okay. So, what now we would like to do is um, do a word coffee style of discussion. Um, uh, obviously, um, there will be a little bit, uh, there will be five different groups. Uh, we would like you to separate into five different groups. In a, uh, in a second, we will show you how. And um, there will be five different uh, questions. Do you want to, uh, until I, okay, okay. Okay, well, I guess uh, everybody has been here once, and uh, in this group we were discussing about the alternative research assessment indicators. Um, as you see, like groups started writing down their ideas, 
and then we started to put um, like green dots for the ideas people liked and red dots for the ideas that people disliked the most. And I'm just going to um, tell something about the most, um, like, let's say, commented, liked or disliked uh, ones. So as you see, evaluation of teaching, lots of people found to be an interesting idea for an alternative indicator. Um, but as you see with this half uh, red and green dots, um, that was a comment that said, well, uh, that's highly, actually highly subjective. If you ask students to evaluate teaching, then um, yeah, that's yeah, not an objective indicator. Um, yeah, so then impact factor, of course, it's like what I heard from, from people. It's like not an alternative, it's what's done now. And I think somebody just put the green dot there to make it look like um, balanced. So there would be like one that is against the trend, but okay, um, actually like that was the most disliked one. And then um, I'm just going to read through, um, like also like was old metrics, um, uh, progress reports were disliked, um, and the age index was like one time and uh, one time disliked. So um, yeah, well, that's what I can say. Okay, you're welcome. All right, so I've seen most of you at my table. We talked about open peer review. It was a really nice question, although nobody had experience with it. So the question was, what experience do you have with open peer review? Nobody had any. So we just started a discussion on whether the experience we had about closed or double closed uh, peer review and what difference that would have made if that review you had was open. So we had a couple of uh, answers here. The first one, which was uh, which was cause for a lot of controversy because of the last line, so we're just going to quickly go over it. Um, we, so th we didn't have any experience. Uh, but the peer review, if it was open, it might cause troubles if it would be, for example, a student evaluating a teacher, so reviewing a teacher. That might be cause for problem. So most of the people agreed with that, but uh, then most of the people didn't agree with the last line. That is that the blind peer review is worse because someone can write down whatever they want. And that was kind of controversial because most of the reviewers do have to have some kind of certification or anything like that. So they mostly keep it professional. So it, they need to apply constructive criticism in their reviews. So. That way, open, they thought open peer review uh, wouldn't be better. So most people agree with that from the side of the uh, reviewer. Then side of the author, it might be better, the second group said, and most people agree with that too. Because if the name of the reviewer is written down, you know like who it is, you know the experience the person has and which way they are thinking. Like the last group said, like if the reviewer, for example, um, has a lot of papers that go in a certain direction, that think in a certain direction, their review might also go in that same direction. They can like push their own ideas into their review. And if it's open, you obviously know that they would be like pushing it. When it's closed, you wouldn't know it. And then we had a couple of other experiences written down, but in large, that was the conclusion we had. It, could be better from the uh, author uh, perspective because you would obviously know, but from the reviewer perspective, it might not be better because your name is on it and your review, you might you might like uh, try to constrict yourself to less edgy criticism, uh, less edgy reviews if your name was on it than when your name wasn't on it. So that was the conclusion that like most groups had, but not my ideas, the ideas of the other people in the room. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so hi everyone. Um, our task was to discuss what experience, no? Uh, yeah, <laughs> how relevant uh, open access uh, publishing is in our research fields and to share our experiences. Now, the first thing we need to clarify is before we even come to the uh, question of research field and experiences, 
that this highly depends on which country you're from because in certain countries uh, you can't opt out of open access publishing anymore and this um, these countries are those whose uh, national uh, funding agencies are members of the so-called coalition s uh, and or uh, that are in the european union because the european commission is also part of the coalition s uh, I won't go into detail what Coalition S is, but then you also have certain, um, uh, certain combinations possible, meaning that certain uh, countries are both in the EU uh, and their national funding body is in the Coalition S. So, for example, Slovenia is such a case. Then, uh, for example, the country is in the European Union, but the national funding body is not in the Coalition S. Uh, such cases are, for example, Croatia, Hungary, Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, or the country is not in the European Union, but the national funding body is in the coalition S, for example, Norway, uh, UK since Brexit, uh, uh, some African countries, Canada, and uh, certain um, non-governmental organizations in the US. Uh, in these cases then the research field doesn't matter uh, and uh, in others where the open access policies is not mandatory in either of these uh, levels uh, then the researchers have um, uh, can voluntarily opt in to open access publishing and the uh, experiences that we gathered in the discussion were that uh, this is uh, regarded um, generally as pos uh, positive because it increases the visibility of the research, highly increases, certain people said. Uh, it also saves time and enables you to uh, keep track with the new developments uh, in the field. Uh, and most people I noticed also like the idea of open access publishing. Here, unfortunately, I need to say that my, uh, my personal experience is negative because I come from the uh, field of analytical chemistry or chemistry in general, which is one of the most skeptical of open access publishing because of the uh, patent potential. And uh, even though in Slovenia open access publishing is man mandatory, uh, there is still a lot of pushback. So that's it. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, yeah. So uh, the question is what kind of research assessment practice does your institution follow? Uh, this is kind of interesting because we don't directly know which specific type of research assessment, but uh, we come up with a lot of answers. And I came from the purple team, so I will just summarize everything. So the first one on our list is double blind peer review. Everybody are familiar with this, like we don't know who's the, the reviewer, we don't know also who's the author. We also include the other group, uh, the blind peer review. Uh, and next one, we usually check the impact factor. Like for university or those who are working in academe, this is very important. But I don't know really if for industry this also matters. So aside from impact factors, we also have the number of citation and the age score. And then we also check uh, the, we do assessment before, during, and after the research. So be, during the planning, uh, uh, yeah, during the uh, application of the research project, and also after as a summative. So that's the different phases of assessment. And we also include the benchmarking. For benchmarking, uh, it's like if they're in some institution, they have these best practices, we try to adapt it. Like for example, if in Slovenia, ha uh, Maribor have uh, um, really good um, practices for assessing, so in Alte, we'll try to adapt it in, in there. And we also have include this quality assurance. It's a, like a special organization as part of the institution where they try, their main goal is to uh, make sure that all the research projects are in, in according to the standards. And uh, the gray group include also the, it's, I think it's for IT, right? Uh, domestic evaluation. 
and this is for the blue group uh, we need to also uh, need to assess the credibility of the researchers so sometimes we try to work on some researches or projects that we're not uh, really specialized with so we also need to include the credibility of the researchers uh, collaboration conferences workshop uh, feedbacks uh, from the research community uh, these are all uh, also we can also receive some assessment through questionings giving opinions from our peers and etc and then also we have the should have the ethical approval um, this is for the psychology uh, researchers guidance from psychological support um, annual refreshment is also needed like we need to have update if we uh, we have updated uh, standards, so we should have this annual refreshment of the knowledge as a training. Uh, professional development is part of this, and also teaching and mentoring of the students for supervisors and also to, to young, to young researchers, and also uh, peer review, um, review from the colleagues and supervisor in your faculty or your department. So these are the assessment practices. Yeah. So uh, the question was, okay, hi guys. So the question was, uh, tell us about national initiatives in open access in your country. So the thing is, we br broke it down into, uh, so it's national, more of a regional as well, and more of an international as well, like in open access. And we also broke it down from open access and semi-open access, if you might say. So the first one is this, uh, the, the one of the uh, well-known or general initiative is the creation of repositories. Like for example here, uh, we've listed it out, like in Serbia, they have DOI Serbia, in Croatia, they have Crosby, and in the Philippine Islands, they have NLP. And what I'm going to discuss right now is these, the, the uh, what do you call this? The open access and the semi-open access. So the thing is that Open access in a way that there's no restrictions, everyone can access it. But there's also, I would say, we call it the semi-open access, that you need uh, membership through the society, like a research society or something like that. Like you need this uh, membership, like or permission to access the, the documents. Like for example, university repositories, like in the Philippines. In the University of the Philippines, it's open access, but you need a membership, or at least, uh, uh, a permission from the the one who is in charge in that repository like an email maybe saying that you you want to access this and the next one is the regional initiative in the southeast asia we have this uh, southeast digital library it's a collection of all open access uh, open access journals from the southeast asia region and all all documents in this uh, uh, participating open access journal can uh, can store their researchers in this digital library. And of course, uh, Sci-Hub, more of an international or global illegal repository, if you would say, and because of academic piracy. But then a lot of us use this because this is, uh, it's open for everyone. It's like created by everyone and should be accessed by everyone. So I just want to leave it there and thank you very much.